glad to be here this morning. That was pretty good. Let's try it one more time. How many of you are glad to be here this morning? Woo! Come on, there, there you go. Come on. Come on. God's good. Amen. Come on. So, we have been talking about the power of the resurrection. We've been talking about, you know, in this series, and we've been looking at the resurrection appearances of Jesus in John chapter 20 and 21. There are six of those. And, and in each of those encounters, we learn something about the, how the resurrection power of Jesus, the presence of the risen Christ, transformed people's lives. And so the first week, we talked about Mary Magdalene. She went to the, to the tomb, and it was empty, and she was what? Discouraged. She was disappointed. She was in despair. And she brought that to Jesus, and when she brought it, what did he do? He said, man, he talked to her tenderly, and he listened to her, and he revealed himself to her, and the resurrection of power of Jesus transformed her. She went from discouraged to encouraged. Come on. And then last week we talked about the disciples, because after she met Jesus, she ran all the way back into town, and she said to the disciples, hey, hey, it's all Jesus, he's alive. But the word says that they were, what, barricaded behind the door because of fear. And Jesus showed up in the midst of them, and, and He brought peace. And the resurrection power of Jesus, the risen Savior, enabled them to overcome their fear. The third story has to deal with this subject. Resurrection power over doubt. Now, I want you to imagine for a minute that you've never met me, alright? Never met me, and, I, and you and I have to be sitting at a table together, and I look at you and I say, tell me one thing about you that would describe who you are, that would help me understand who you are. Just, just tell me one thing, not one word, but you know, one sentence, one phrase, whatever. And I want you to think about that. Something to help me just to know who you are. What would you say to me if we had never met? What was the, what was the first thing you would tell me about yourself? Now, I want you to think about that for a moment, okay? If you want to, you can even jot there in your notes. There's a little spot for it. All right, I need, I need a volunteer. So if we, were for, if we met for the very first time, what, what would you tell me about yourself? Come on, I need a volunteer. Don't make me pick one. Oh, Kim, Kim's got her hand up. What would you tell me about yourself? Blessed. You're blessed, okay, great. I would say that I am a person that loves her family with all her heart. A person who loves her family with all her heart. And so you would tell me those things, and, and I would begin to get a picture of who you are. But one of the greatest preachers of, of the last century was by a man by the name of A.W. Tozer. And A.W. Tozer said this. He answered that, this question this way. What a person believes about God is about that person. In other words, what you believe about God, what I believe about God, what your family believes about God, what this church believes about God, tells me more about you, tells me more about... Your family tells me more about your church than anything else you could tell me. What you believe about God communicates volumes. Listen, if people are looking for a church, you've got to understand this. If, if I was going to go look for a new church, if I, suddenly I asked to, Brenda and I need some place to go, you know what I'm going to look at? I'm going to look at their statement of faith. Because I'm going to want to know what they believe. Because what they believe tells me volumes about who they are. Amen? What they believe about God, what they believe about Jesus, what they believe about Holy Spirit, what they believe about who He's created us to be, who we are in Christ, all those things tell me volumes about what that church is really about, who they really are. And the reality is, what you and I believe about God shapes our lives. It drives our attitudes. It defines our values. It reflects the level of victory in which we live in. See, what do you believe about God? What you believe about God is the most important thing about you. Say, well, I've never heard that before. I want you to think about it. What you believe about God changes and transforms everything about you. Now, I want you to understand this, though. The enemy of our souls, the enemy of God, loves doubt. See, he wants you and I to doubt the things of God. He wants you and I to doubt what we believe, doubt what we stand for, doubt what we've been taught, doubt what God has said. He wants us to have doubt. Why? Because see, doubt is like cancer of the soul. 
Doubt is like a weed eater in your flower bed. Come on now. When? Your husband ever get the weed eater in your flower bed? Oh, he better not. It's pretty ugly in there. It's like taking your rototiller, Earl, and going out in the garden and get it, letting it get away from you. Man, it will tear up stuff in a hurry. Why? Because doubt's like that cancer that will just eat through. Man, it will tear up. It will dis disrupt. It will destroy things in our life. And so let's, let's get a, a definition on the table. Number one, what's doubt? What is doubt? Well, doubt is a lack of confidence. Doubt is a that we call something into question. The doubt means that we have an uncertainty about the realism or the validity of something. I like, I like to put doubt this way. Doubt is an unsettled opinion or perspective about something, about the certainty of something. It's a doubt. See, faith, faith is, you know, belief is, I know that I know that I know. Faith is, I, I'm absolutely positive. Faith is, there is no, there's absolutely nothing that could talk me out of this. I believe it, I know it, and that's it. Period. Amen? That's faith. That's believing. Doubt is, well, you know, I think it's true. I'm pretty sure it's true. I hope it's true. I want it to be true. Man, I, 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 but I'm not 100% positive. I'm 95%, but, I, but I'm not quite sure absolutely every time it's true. That's doubt. Now, let's take a little survey, all right? Can you help me out here? All right, how many of you here this morning have no doubts about gravity? Come on, come on. How many of you are absolutely, positively, beyond a shadow of a doubt, sure, what's going to happen when I throw this bottle in the air? What's going to happen? It's going to come right back down. Why? Because gravity, whatever goes up, comes down. And you and I believe gravity, amen? We have faith in gravity. We live our lives in, the, in light of the fact that gravity works. In fact, if I got up on top of the church building this morning, and I went over here on the end, and somehow, in my, my oldness, I got up on top of the steeple, and I'm standing up there, and I jump off. I, I go like that, I'm standing up there, and I just jump off, and I start flapping my arms... And I'm like, I'm going to fly. How many of you are absolutely sure you're going to scrape me off the parking lot? Come on. Why? Because you believe gravity, amen? You live your life in light of the gravity. You're not going to let Keith get on that chair anymore by, over here by the wall because gravity is going to work on Keith one of these days. Come on, amen? We know how it works. Now, we all believe gravity, but how about this one? How about life on other planets? How many of us are absolutely sure that life on other planets exists? How many of us are absolutely sure it doesn't exist? Oh, Earl's like, ah, then it doesn't exist, all right? Earl said, no. But the rest of us are sitting here saying, I, I, I don't know. I don't know, maybe. It'd be kind of cool if it did. I don't know, God could if he wanted. I, I don't know. And because we have doubts about the reality that there's life on other planets, listen, we don't live our lives running around looking for flying saucers. Amen? We don't run around down to the grocery wondering if, if that guy over there is an alien. <laughs> Why? We don't live our life in light of that truth. Why? Because we doubt. We have doubts. How about God? How about the promises of God? Do we doubt those? Do we believe that God is good all the time? In absolutely every situation, God is good, that God will provide for me, that God loves me, God will forgive me, God will take care of me, God will do all those things. That I believe that I believe that I believe that God will do those things. That God will take care of those things. Come on, most of us, are, you know, I see some heads doing this. Yep, yeah, I believe that. I believe that. But listen, it's not just what we say we believe. It's what we live we believe. See, the question is not can I say it, not do I proclaim it. Do I live in light of it? Do I live my life like it's true? That I believe it is true? That it's true? Do I believe in, you know, that God is all this goodness? Because you see what happens on a good day? On a good day, we're like, yeah, come on, man. Yep, 
Those are absolutely true. On a not so good day, we're like, yep, yep, it's good. I believe it, I believe it. Even on a bad day, we're like, man, I'm struggling a little bit today, but man, I, I'm, I'm proclaiming it's true. I'm proclaiming it's true, but then, then trials come and tribulation comes and hard times come and, and things begin to happen. And listen, a lot of times in the midst of that, what begins to happen? We begin to waver a little. Why? We don't see it happening. We don't see it taking place. We, you know, things don't seem to be going all right. And, and what happens? We begin to waver a little bit. And, and on a really bad day, we're like, we, I, I hope it's true. I hope it's a yes. And what I want you to understand is, as soon as our yes begins to waver, doubt has snuck in. Doubt has entered the equation. Now, don't get all shook up. Because I want you to understand this, doubt doesn't equal unbelief. See, a lot of Christians, they get all worked up because they're like, well, if I doubt, I must be an unbeliever, so I can't ever talk about my doubt because everybody will think I'm not a Christian. That's a lie of the devil. Having a doubt doesn't equal unbelief. See, unbelief is I refuse to believe. That's unbelief. Unbelief is that no matter what I see or what I know or what I experience, I, 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 I'm not going to believe it's true. You know, there are people in the world like that. There are certain things that they, no matter what happens, they're going to believe they're, you know, going to believe them or not believe them. There are people who on the, on, 10, do you know 10% of the U.S. population believe the earth's flat? Go on now. Do you, Garrett, or Garrett, do you ever, do you believe that? No, nope, Garrett, ever done believe that? 10% of the U.S. population believes the earth's flat. No matter what you tell them or what you show them, they still believe it's flat. Or they believe we didn't go, 10% believe we didn't go to the moon. You know, more than 10% believe in this thing called the zombie apocalypse. Somehow the dead's going to get up and start wandering the earth, and you know, we better be prepared. See, they have convinced themselves, and no matter what I would say or you would say or anybody else would say, isn't going to change their mind. They're not going to believe the earth's round. They're not going to believe that, that we went to the moon. And they're not going to believe that dead's dead and you don't get back up and walk around. Amen? Come on. They don't, they're not going to believe that. See, that's unbelief. But doubt's different. Doubt is something different. See, doubt is, is this thing that says, I'm a little unsettled about it. It's an uncertainty. It's a lack of confidence in that something's true. But watch this now. When doubt is nurtured, when doubt goes unchecked, when doubt is prolonged, it can, and watch this now, it will turn into unbelief. When I let my doubt go unchecked, it can become unbelief in my life. I'll give me an example. There are, how many of you know that in this book, in God's Word, it says that if you believe that what? That Jesus was the Son of God and that He died on the cross, He was buried and raised on the third day. If you believe that, and you believe that he is Lord, you confess that he is Lord, what's this, word, what's this book say? That you will be saved. That you will be forgiven. He says, hey, it's a done deal. You didn't do anything to earn it. Jesus did it all. You're saved. Amen? Amen? That's what the Word says. And we are to what? Believe it. But you know how many long-term, 50-year Christians who sit in the pew all their life I have visited with, and suddenly the end of life or death or other things come up and all of a sudden they begin to say to me, Pastor, well, when I get to the pearly gates, I hope they let me in. When, 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 I, when I get there, I hope I've done enough good stuff to get me in. Pastor, you think they'll let me in? What happened? Somewhere along the line, doubt snuck in, and doubt unchecked will become and border on unbelief. I still remember sitting with a lady in her 80s who loved the Lord all her life, and she said, Pastor, I just don't know. I'll get in. Listen, it's Jesus Christ alone. Amen? Faith in Jesus Christ alone. But listen, the enemy of God wants to bring doubt, and doubt erodes faith. 
And if we're not careful, if we don't deal with it, it can become unbelief. It can grow in us. And so this morning, I want us to look at the story of the most famous doubter of all. You all know his name, right? What's his name? It's Thomas. How come you all know Thomas? You all know Thomas. I, I tell you what, so we're going to go to John chapter 20 again. If you want to follow along your Bible, you can. It's on the screen. It's in your paper. What, wherever you want. You're comfortable following along. But let me, let me submit this to you. I want to submit this morning that Thomas gets a bad rap. I want to submit that we, we reign on Thomas's parade, that, that we put a lot of stuff at Thomas's feet that don't belong, don't, doesn't deserve to be there. We call him Doubting Thomas. But I want you to look, as we look at the record of Thomas' life, I, I want to suggest there's a lot of other things that Thomas kind of had it going on. In John chapter 11, when they were going to, uh, Jesus was going to go and raise Lazarus from the dead, the other disciples are like, hey, hey, you're going to Jerusalem, man, they don't like you there. Jesus and Mac, they're pretty, they're pretty bent up on you, and if you go to Jerusalem, they might just kill you there. You know, we shouldn't go there, and Jesus is like, we're going anyway. And look what Thomas, watch this now, John chapter 11, verse 16, Thomas says, Therefore Thomas, is called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, Let us go so that we may die with him. Now, come on now, that sounds like a guy's got some faith, Amen. Come on, you guys are unsure whether we should go, and the reason you don't want to go is because they're after Jesus, and they're after Jesus, they're after us. But Thomas is like, hey, come on, let's go. Come on, we'll die with him, it'll be okay. No one wants to read that verse about poor Thomas. Or how about in John 14? They're up in the upper room on the last night of Jesus' life, and Jesus begins to tell them it's time for him to go. It's time to get out of town. He said, I'm going back to heaven. He said, if I go, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and it's going to be streets of gold, there are going to be mansions, and he starts telling all this stuff. And, and, and who is it that pipes up in the conversation? It's our man Thomas. And Thomas is like, hey, Lord, Lord, we want to go there too. Wherever you go, we want to go. We want to be there with you, but Lord, Lord, I'm just going to be honest with you, man. We're, we're struggling with where you're going. We don't know how to get there. And what's Jesus say to Thomas? John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. No one comes to the Father. Thomas, this guy who we call the doubter, man, he is killing it. He is clued in. He's filled with faith. And so I've got three principles as we look at Thomas's story that I think help us in, in the face of doubt. Number one is this. Watch this. Principle one is this. Our faith suffers when we're passive with our doubt. Our faith suffers when we just let our doubt go. Look what John 20 says. Verse 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. Now I want you to notice something. Last week, we talked about what happened on that first resurrection night. What happened, that, that there they were all barricaded in the room, and, and, and Jesus shows up in their midst, and Jesus comes in the midst of their conversation, comes in the midst of everything they're doing, and he reveals himself to us. But here's the deal. Thomas wasn't there. Thomas wasn't with them. Now, I don't know where Thomas was. I don't know what he was doing. Maybe he had a meeting to go to. Maybe he had a kid's game. Maybe, you know, maybe he needed to go to the grocery. Maybe he was binge watching Netflix on the couch. We, we don't know where Thomas was. But what we do know was he wasn't with the other disciples. What we do know was you know, he wasn't where he was supposed to be. See, what happens is he was off doing something else instead of being with the other disciples. Instead of being with those who are care, caring for one another and nurturing one another and building one another up. See, Thomas was off on his own, doing his own things, trying to deal with his doubt by himself. But here's the deal. Here's another reason we've got to give Thomas some slack. All the disciples doubted. See, we blame Thomas for not believing. But they all doubted. Mary Magdalene doubted. You know, John and Peter, when they went to the tomb, they doubted. They went back, told the story. They all doubted. Mary went back, said she'd seen Jesus. They're still doubting. All of them doubted. Why? Because they needed an encounter with Jesus. All of them doubted. 
Listen, and the last thing they all needed in the midst of their doubt was to be alone. The worst thing they could have done was to isolate themselves. See, they needed one another. We need one another. They needed to encourage one another. They needed to lift each other. They needed to speak hope and truth into one another. They needed to do those things. But listen, the truth is for many believers, at the point of our doubt, instead of pressing in, we pull back. When doubt begins to sneak in, what do we do? We begin to isolate ourselves and pull back and not press in and be willing to say, you know what, I've kind of, I, I got a question here. I'm a little uncertain here. I, I, I think I, sh- I ought to be believing, but I'm not. And we pull back rather than push in to what we need to. Because why? We need the encouragement of one another. We need encouragement to one another. Because see, if you and I try and handle our doubt ourselves, if we try and deal with it ourselves, if we try and you know, shove it in the background, we try and back burner it, if we just try to ignore it, listen, it's not going away. Come on. Listen to me. You got, you got, a, big old, you got a big old growth on your leg? Well, you know, I'm just going I'm just, oh, to pretend it's not there. <laughs> We're looking at Earl. <laughs> It ever happened to you? You're just trying to pretend stuff didn't. In, 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 if I don't acknowledge it, if I don't mention it, it's not really true. It's not really there. See, that's what a lot of Christians do with their doubt. We're like, ah, it's not really there. It's not really an issue. Come on, it's a big time issue. But it's not an issue that's going to separate us from God. Listen, it's an issue that we need to deal with. And we need to deal with our doubts. Listen. The last year, the last 14 months now, in the middle of the COVID thing, the greatest event of fear and doubt to come in our lifetime. Amen? You all agree with that? Amen? The absolute last thing the church of Jesus Christ needed to be doing was isolating themselves. The last thing the church of Jesus Christ needed to be doing was being whole up at home and not get together. Why? We needed one another to encourage and to speak life and truth and hope into one another. And I want to submit to you, the enemy was smiling big time when people said you need to close up the church. That's exactly what he wants. Because if he can isolate you, maybe he can work on you. Come on. That's why we need the church. You don't need the church because of the organization. You need the church because God wants to do a work in you. And you can't do it out there by yourself. He's going to do it in here with this group of people. Amen? We need one another. We need to be together. Listen, and fear and doubt has even kept churches closed to today. Earl Linda were telling me about a church still closed. I know another little church still closed. Have not been open for 14 months. Why? Fear and doubt and, and all those things have kept them closed. Kept them away from one another. Listen, the devil's just like doing a dance on that thing. Amen? See, when we have concerns, when we have doubts, when we have broken, we have those things, man, we ought to be running to be with our brothers and sisters and not be pulling back. We're going to find the help. That's where we're going to find comfort. That's where we're going to find encouragement. That's the picture he paints. Watch this now. I want you to understand that faith grows and doubt flees when I get together with other believers. See, I'm not even talking about coming in this room. I'm talking about getting together with other believers. Maybe that's one or two other people. Listen, in the midst of COVID, we could have got together with one or two other people. Amen? Come on. We needed one another. Some of you did. You got on the phone with one another. You talked to one another. You cared about one another. But listen, there are a lot of Christians who were on their own. Come on, we're watching a video online. Come on, that's not getting it. We need one another. We need to share our hearts and our struggles and our trials. We need to get with other people. Maybe that's a small group. Maybe that's a Bible study. Whatever it is, where we know other people who can get into the Word. Who, can, who know how to pray. Other people who know how to encourage us. Other people who know how to lift us up. Who can speak life into us. See, we need that. We don't need to pull back. We need to press in. We need to press into those things. What a powerful picture. Because you see... When we get together in the room, doubt has no room to grow. And in fact, doubt in the presence of Jesus has got to go. Well, that's a good place for an amen. Amen? Come on. In the presence of Jesus, doubt has to go. Come on. It has to go. 
Maybe you're here this morning, man, you've been trying to do that thing on your own. You're trying to live out this Christian life. I'm just kind of hanging. I, I come to church and I sit in my pew, but I, I'm not really not in a relationship with other believers and, and other people who speak life and hope into me. Listen, I, 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 that, that's a bad plan. Because the enemy will cast the seeds of doubt into our spirit. And we need the help of others to weed those out. To begin to restore faith. What a powerful picture. Faith grows deeper watch it, when we gather together, but faith grows and doubt flees. Watch this, when we worship with other believers. Come on, when we worship with other believers, when we get together, my, when we get together here on Sunday my, morning, my faith is nurtured, you know, my, my doubts are challenged, my spirit gets energized. When we gather together on Sunday mornings and we worship and we praise and we pray and, and we celebrate and we get in His Word, man, man, something powerful happens when we corporately get together and, and man, we get with God, Amen? Something powerful happens. That's why he said don't forsake the assembling together with your brothers and sisters. Not because he's trying to draw a crowd, because he knows you need it and I need it. Man, we need it. Oh, man, it's critical in helping us to what? To head off, to stay the course, to get ahead of doubt. Say, well, pastor, but we're busy. We've got lots of stuff going on in our lives. Man, we've got ball games and grandkids and vacations and you know, all kinds of stuff going on. And we just can't get there on a regular basis. You know, we just can't get to Bible study. We can't get to prayer meeting. We can't get together in a small group. We can't get to Sunday school. We can't, you know, we're just really busy. We've got, we got a lot of irons in the fire, Pastor. I understand that. I, I absolutely, perfectly understand that. But you need to understand this. When that's our position, when that's our perspective, we're opening the door for doubt. Come on. Say, well, I don't like that very much. Well, I say, well, it doesn't matter. That's because of what the Lord says. See, doubt gets driven out in His presence. You say, well, I, I can hang out with Jesus in the boat. Well, sure you can. But listen, there is something that happens when you get together. Come on, how, how many of you here in the last couple of weeks in, the, in this corporate gathering, Jesus has like got a hold of some stuff? Come on, amen? Come on. Well, listen, that didn't happen out on the boat. It could happen out on the boat, but listen, more often than not, it happens in, in a c corporate gathering like this where we all agree together to, to seek after Him. Amen? Amen? Come on, we need this. This isn't is optional. This isn't, oh, well, it feels good, or if I got an extra time. Man, if you want to truly grow in your faith, we've got to get together with other believers. We've got to worship together. We've got to make that a priority. See, the problem was, first of all, Thomas wasn't gathered with the other believers. Thomas was by himself. But here's the second thing, principle number two. Our faith is kindled when the object of our doubt is identified. Watch this now. When the object or the root of my doubt is identified, man, my faith begins to be kindled and grow. Luke says, verse 25, And so the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. Now, now, now think about this. Thomas isn't there, but then he comes back. And all of a sudden, they're like, hey, guys, they're like, Thomas, man, you should have been here, baby. Woo! Man, what a service we had. Jesus showed up, and man, we saw him, and we touched the holes and the sides, and everything was going great. And, and you know that word, they kept, it says saying to him is in the present tense in the Greek, which means they kept saying to him. You ever get tired of that? Somebody's like, man, man, you should have been here last Sunday, man. It was awesome. Man, it was incredible. What an incredible service we had. And, and man, I can't believe you missed it, man. And Thomas is like just getting fed up because like he wasn't there. And he missed out. He's like, well, what's going on? And finally Thomas says, unless I see his hands, the imprint of the nails, and I put my finger in with the place of the nails, and I put my hand in his side, I will not believe. Man, Thomas is like, man, I'm glad you guys saw Jesus. I'm glad you touched him. I'm glad all those things happened for you. But listen, listen, I need to touch him myself. I need to touch them myself. I need to put my hands in the holes. Now, this is the point where everybody starts jumping on Thomas. Well, he should have believed. Oh, he should have believed. You know, we had the women, and then we had John, Peter and John, and then we had the resurrection appearance of Mary, and she told the story, and then he shows up to the 11, and they're all telling the story. Thomas should have believed the testimony and the witness of everybody else about his doubt. 
But I want you to notice something. Thomas wasn't asking for anything that the others hadn't already gotten. See, we get all bent up on Thomas. Well, he had to see. Listen, they all saw. Come on. And here's truth. That if you truly want to believe, if you truly want to believe, Jesus will reveal Himself to you. Amen? Come on. If you want to believe. Now, if you don't want to believe, that we have to hold that with sermon. But listen, if you truly want to believe, if you want to bring your doubt and say, Jesus, I got this doubt. Here's the things I need, Jesus. Here's the areas of doubt. I'm, I'm really worried, Jesus, because I haven't got my finger in your hand yet. I haven't touched the hole yet in your hand. Jesus, here is the point of my doubt, and I'm going to bring it to you. Listen, when we're faithful to do that, what's Jesus do? Jesus will show up. And he'll deal with the doubt. Amen? He'll reveal to you what needs to be revealed. He'll show himself to you. Man, I, I, I love that. You know how many times in my life, here's what I call, and some of you will be offended, but that's okay. It's like God, Jesus shows up and it's like a little wet kiss. Man, I just, need, I just need something special and all of a sudden he shows up and something intimate happens. And it's like, oh my gosh. Thank you, Jesus. You showed up in the midst of my, of my doubt, in the midst of my concern, in the midst of my uneasiness. You showed up. When? When? When I brought it to Him. When I, when I identified it said, Lord, here it is. Not that I hid it. Not that I shoved it in the corner. I got it out. Come on, we've got to get our doubt out. See, Thomas knew what the barrier was. And he brought it to Jesus. Which begs the question for you and I. What are we struggling with? What area of doubt are you and I struggling with in our lives, in our marriages, in our families? What doubts might we have? Doubts that God said this in His Word, that God promised me this in His Word, that God spoke these things over my life, but now because I can't quite see it. Or maybe because it's been a long time coming. Or I I've been believing for a long time. I've been trusting for a long time. And all of a sudden, those seeds of doubt begin to get sown, and they begin to take a little bit of root, and we begin to waver a little. And his question is, what are those areas in our life where doubt seems to be sneaking in? Or better yet, where are those areas of life where doubt has come on full bore in our lives? And we begin to question the things of God. See, it doesn't matter how big or small it is or how wonderful or great it is. Jesus will meet us. He'll encounter us at the point of our doubt. And he'll deal with it. Jesus will reveal himself to the person who truly wants to believe. Who truly wants to be free from doubt. Our faith suffers when we try and hide, when we try to cover up our doubt. Our, safe, our faith begins to be kindled when we identify the object but here's faith, principle number three. Faith soars when Jesus invades the point of our doubt. Look what it says in verse 26. After eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. <laughs> Good news! Thomas is now where he's supposed to be. Amen? He's now hanging out with them. He's now with them. <laughs> and, and, but I want you to notice something interesting here. How long has it been? Eight days. Thomas had to wait on Jesus to encounter him at the point. See, I'm sure before the eight days got around, Thomas was saying, I, I have to see before I can believe. But eight days go by. Why? Because the setting and the timing had to be right to encounter Thomas. See, if we have this, this Santa Claus God, this genie in a bottle God, that we just pray and ask and boom, you know, by, by 11.30, man, we're, it's all dealt with. No, no, no. See, sometimes he has to line some things up to deal with the things that's in our lives, and it's a process he's working on in us. But listen, he is rooting out. Because see, listen, I was out in the garden yesterday, and some of that nasty purple stuff you see out in the field, that's awful. It's awful enough in the field. Come on, Sandy, I saw you guys at a field that had a beautiful display of that. And the reality is, 
That's off. I'm out there, and I got the hoe, and, I, and I'm digging, and, and, and I'm digging, and I'm digging. Listen, you just can't break that stuff off the ground. What do you got to do? You got to dig down and get the root. See, I want you to understand that God doesn't want to, you know, just put a band-aid on your doubt. Jesus doesn't just want to give you a, you know, a little smiley face on your doubt. He wants to root out the, the bottom issue that it can be taken from the root out. Lord, it won't deal with it anymore. Amen? Somebody say amen. That's a good place for an amen. How many of you would like to get the, rid of the root so you don't have to get dealing with the fruit? Come, come on, Earl. That, that kind of went on with you rising this morning. Amen? Come on. I, that, just, that just flowed right out there. How about that? See, that's what Jesus wants to do. Jesus isn't in the business of just cutting stuff off at the ground. Jesus is in the business of dealing with the root of the problem, the root of the issue. So it's been eight days. Verse 26, after eight days, the disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. And Jesus came, the doors having been shut, again, shut up hard, and stood in their midst. Now this time, Thomas was there. Thomas was right there in the midst. He wasn't in the boat. He wasn't on the couch. He wasn't, you know, wasn't anywhere else. He was in the room with the believers. And Jesus shows up once again. And he what? He comes to him and he offers Thomas the same thing he'd offered to the others. You got to hear that. He offered Thomas the same thing he offered the others. Look what it says, verse 27. Then he said to Thomas, reach here with your finger and see my hands and reach here with your hand and put it in my side and do not be unbelieving but what was the root problem i got to touch jesus shows up says go ahead here you go touch the holes touch my side thomas believe Whew. same thing jesus wants to say to you Jesus, here's my doubt. And Jesus shows up and says, here, here's what you need. Now believe. Now believe. What a powerful picture. But I want you to notice the second thing. Is that Jesus isn't mad at Thomas. See, we somehow think that Jesus is going to get mad at us if we confess up our doubt. Somehow we're not faithful enough or something some high church nonsense that we got taught years ago you know what you gotta fake it till you make it you know that that whole thing you know i'm gonna come to church and fake it like everything's good hoping i'll make it listen that accomplishes zero can you say zero say zero zero it accomplishes zero why because we got to come and say hey jesus here it is Here's the deal I'm dealing with. Here's the thing I'm doubting. Here's the thing I'm struggling with. And then Jesus can go to work on it. When I'm trying to fake it, I'm, 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 I'm closing everybody out and listen to me. I'm certainly closing out Jesus. Come on, we were laughing back here. I, 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 before the service, I was back there with Kim. And, you know, and, and come on, Kim, let's just be honest. You were acting a little guilty about watching what you were watching on your phone because it was your granddaughter. And, and, and you, you said, but the Lord knows what I'm doing. Amen? Amen? Come on, the Lord Jesus already knows. Who are you hiding it from? Well, what will other people think? Well, other people aren't going to stand before Jesus with you. Other people aren't going home with you to deal with what you've got to deal with. Amen? Come on, Jesus wants you to get free. Jesus wants you to have freedom over that doubt, over that thing that you're struggling with. And notice, when he shows up, notice what happens, verse 28, and Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Now, now, see, we read that, and we read that in our, in our high church mannerisms. My God and my Lord. No, 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 that's not how it happened. Here's how it really happened. That all of a sudden, Jesus shows up, he puts his fingers in the hole. Thomas put his fingers in there, and he touches his side, and all of a sudden, he's like, oh, Lord, Je Jesus, it's you! Man, he's jumping and celebrating, and he's getting all excited. Why? Because Jesus had revealed himself in the midst of his doubt. And the resurrection power of Jesus had overcome doubt, had wiped out doubt, had dealt with doubt, and no longer was he doubting Thomas. Amen? And neither were any of the other disciples. So here's the question for you this morning. What area of your life, of your faith, 
as doubt, as doubt crept in. What area has the seeds of doubt maybe snuck in? It wasn't intentional. You know, no one, <laughs> Jesus didn't look and say, well, see, I told you so. No, 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 that's not Jesus. The seeds got in there and doubt began to grow. And little by little, that doubt began to erode some faith or some belief in some things. Your trust in some things. See, maybe you're here this morning and you're like some of those other people I've met. You heard what the Word said. You prayed the prayer. Man, you got baptized. But somewhere along the line, the seeds of doubt have snuck in. And if you died on the way home today, you're, you would say to yourself, man, I hope I, I, they'll let me in. See, you don't have to hope. See, what the Lord wants to do is He wants to deal with that doubt and restore faith. Amen? Or, or maybe, or maybe this morning you're having doubts about, does God really love me in the condition I'm in? Does God really love me the way I am right now? Well, I, I, you know, is, God, is God really... Is God really in love with someone like me? Or, or this one? Am I really worthy of His blessing? I know me. And I doubt whether I'm really worthy. That's doubt. His Word says, in Him you are worthy. Or maybe there's a little bit of doubt about His faithfulness to provide for you. His faithfulness to take care of your needs. You know, the bank account's a little low or the retirement account isn't what you thought it was going to be. Social Security doesn't go as far as you thought. And you're like, Lord, I'm not sure I'm going to make it. When His promise is, if you're faithful to me, I'll take care of every need you have. Doubt sleeps in. Maybe you're, this morning you've got some doubts about your marriage or your kids or your grandkids. Doubts about a job. Doubts about your career. Doubts about whatever. Doubts about school or my team or my abilities or my whatever. Listen. Jesus says, here's the deal. You just take that doubt. Let's identify it. And let me show up in the midst of it. And let me deal with it and restore you back to a place of faith and belief that I know, that I know, that I know. Amen? In a moment, I'm going to pray, and, you know, kind of gotten this mode, but in your sermon handout today was another little sheet that said, Jesus, I'm going to bring you my doubt. Just between you and Jesus, here's my doubt. Here's my doubt. Jesus, I'm identifying it. And not only am I going to identify, I'm going to bring you. The basket's setting up here. We're going to pray. We're going to worship in a minute. But I'm going to invite you to come. To bring your doubt. Maybe you need to kneel and pray. Maybe you need somebody to pray with you. We'd be glad to pray with you over whatever the situation might be. But just let Jesus invade the doubt that you have. The resurrection power of Jesus to deal with that. Begin dealing with that today that you might be free from it. Amen? He doesn't want you to have doubt. Father, we just pray this morning, Lord, we thank You for Your Word, and Lord, we thank You, Jesus, that You are the one who overcomes our doubts. Jesus, You invade our doubts. And this morning, I just pray, Holy Spirit, You'd help each of us just to be honest. Lord, what's in our heart, what's in our spirits, what's in our minds those areas that maybe we've been covering up or pushing in the background. The Lord today, you're saying, why don't we deal with that today? Why don't we deal with that today? And so, Lord, we just invite you to work among your people, to minister to them, to touch them, to engage them. And Lord, may they, like Thomas, let out a shout, oh Lord, my God, Jesus, it's you. Father, we just thank you and we praise you, Lord. In your mighty name, amen.
Touching it. 